Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. At Kroger, we believe it takes the right team to bring you the freshest produce. That's why we partner with farmers who grow only the best. And that level of teamwork means better, fresher options time and time again. Working with farmers is what it takes to be fresh for everyone. Kroger, fresh for everyone. It's the big $10 sale. So mix and match and get two, three, four, five, or even 10 for $10 with your card. So many great deals. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Tuesday. That's always fun, isn't it? Folks that pronounce the the word day, D, start doing that. Monday, Tuesday. I've lost my brains. Somewhere along the way, I lost my brains. Welcome to off-season episode number... 17. I was ready for it that time. That was all. You know, that was a bit. It was a bit. Off-season episode number 17 of Fantasy NBA Today. Things still a little bit weird over here, schedule-wise, but I think I got time to mash my own lesson learned into the proceedings. We talked about the Brooklyn Nets yesterday. I'm bouncing back and forth. There is little to no organization happening uh, with respect to the order of podcasts that come out in this thing because, damn it, we have, we're not even a month into the fantasy offseason, which extends, of course, from mid-April through May, June, July, August, September, October. It is half the damn year. We are not one month into it, so I can, ep- I can do episodes on whatever topic I want in whatever order I want, and we're just going to bounce between lessons learned and if there's news and playoff stuff and betting stuff, and uh, we'll do teams. But today it's a lesson learned. And also, of course, more playoff stuff. Also, hello, everyone. Welcome to the pod. I'm Dan Vespers. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. At Dan Vespers, that's the account on Twitter. This is a sports ethos presentation. The home of Fantasy NFL today and Fantasy MLB today as well. Yes, yes, yes. Very happy about that. At Ethos Fantasy FB is the football feed. And that one, so not to take anything away from our amazing fantasy baseball show, Joe Arico still continuing to do a terrific job with it. Love it. Show's been great. Growth of that side of the operation here at Sports Ethos has been awesome over the last month and a half. But one thing I will say is over at Ethos Fantasy FB for football, it's going to be a blurb feed, actually, within the next, I think, month and a half, two months at the very longest. And that's going to be a full-fledged football operation. Blurb feed, uh, rank lists, premium packages, the whole thing. Whereas for right now, at least, MLB is just the podcast. Not to say just the podcast. Again, it's a fantastic show. But there's actually a better reason, believe it or not, to follow Ethos Fantasy FB because you're going to be able to get a bunch of football stuff over there in addition to JP's new show. So please do check out Ethos Fantasy FB on Twitter. Continue to rock Ethos Fantasy BB on Twitter for baseball. And please do follow those new podcasts. Fantasy NFL Today, Fantasy MLB Today, and this one, Fantasy NBA Today. The playoffs rumble forth. Or do they? I guess they do. Uh, Milwaukee, Boston, Golden State, Memphis. This is when uh, I'm hoping that we can get roughly a couple games a day, but it's just not going to be that way because when the teams change home court, we're going to get two days off, which I believe creates an off day on Thursday. If I'm getting the numbering right on this, which is just... It's so silly, man. 
we've got we have four series left. There's really no reason why there should be an off day altogether. You can travel in a day. You can travel and then an off day. Oh, the playoffs are so slow to develop in the NBA. I love the playoffs right now. The intensity, but good grief. They trot these games out to us at a snail pace. Screw it. Just play once a week on Sunday. Get it over with. Anywho, Boston, four-point favorites, total of 215.5 in the uh, opener of our doubleheader tonight. Milwaukee, of course, beat Boston 101-89. Boston was favored by four and a half, five points in that ball game. Milwaukee obviously covering by quite a lot, one by 12 outright, so covered by 17. Total on that first game was 218, and it has come down by a solid two to three points. So we're talking an entire possession. That's a pretty good adjustment from game one to game two. What I do want to point out, and by the way, that's the opening and the current line on that Bucks celtics game, is, first of all, money still does continue to kind of creep in on the over. The line opened at 215. It dropped to 214, 214 and a half. So not much, and then it's been kind of ever so slowly creeping its way back up. The thing about the opening game in that series, and, and this is something that we need to internalize a little bit, is that the pace was actually not that absurdly slow. Milwaukee had a lot of rebounds, but that was heavily because Boston missed a ton of shots. I mean, the two teams combined for 102 rebounds. That's a truckload. That's a truckload in a pretty low-scoring game. Giannis didn't shoot the ball well. Drew didn't shoot the ball well. Bobby Portis was pretty good. Grayson Allen was actually decent enough. Pat Connaughton was okay as well. I mean, the big guns for Milwaukee did not have good shooting games, but they were brilliant defensively. Neither team shot the ball from the free throw line all that well or that often, and Boston had a lot of turnovers and shot the ball incredibly poorly. Boston, in particular, did very little with their actual opportunities. If you want to just play the possessions game, Boston had 84 shots, 18 turnovers, so that's 102, and 20 free throws, and if we just do fuzzy math and split that in half, that would be 112 possessions and scored 89 points. Just an absolutely abysmal offensive rating in game one. And I think Boston does make some adjustment. I mean, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be a bit imperfect. Milwaukee does like to goad teams into taking a ton of three-pointers. But Boston's not that bad from downtown. They're not, they're not terrific out there. There are other teams that could punish the Bucks a little bit better than that. But, I mean, if you, you know... Celtics were horrible offensively. Al Horford, 4 for 11. Grant Williams, 2 for 6. Tatum, 6 for 18. Derek White, 2 for 6. Marcus Smart, 3 for 11. Jalen Brown, I believe, was 4 for 13. With 18 turnovers. Like, that's as bad as it could possibly get on the offensive side. However, 215 is... Like, again, if we're just looking and, and we're going fuzzy math style, there were about 220-some-odd possessions in this ballgame. So to that end, if the teams were okay offensively, the game should have gotten to the number. I, I think there's also this world, like kind of like what we when we talked about the Suns and how they've been playing, they're just so efficient offensively. It's the other side of the coin. It's the Warriors and the Nuggets. It's the Suns against anybody. The Bucks and the Celtics are so good defensively when they want to be. Now you're seeing it from Milwaukee after they didn't have Brooke Lopez and frankly didn't really care all that much in the regular season on the defensive side. Now they do. You saw them hold Chicago to some of their worst performances all year long. Now you're seeing it from Boston. It's not fluky. Milwaukee is a terrific defensive team because Giannis is awesome. He's a defensive player of the year candidate annually when he's in his right spot generally, you know, not center. And then Brooke Lopez, who's dramatically underrated as a rim protector and just a big man in general, just a perfect fit on that team. So everybody got pushed back where they're supposed to be. And then Drew Holiday, who we all know is just an unbelievable uh, perimeter defender. I might argue Drew Holiday is the best perimeter defender in the NBA. 
sure I'd get yelled at because Marcus Smart won Defensive Player of the Year and the Bucks didn't play as a team very good defensively. The fact, you know, Smart won it because his team bought into a defensive mindset. I think Drew's probably better. Or whatever. It's close. It doesn't really matter who's better. It's close enough. The reason I bring that up is even though this game ended at 190 total and there were 223 possessions or whatever number we just came up with a minute ago, I mean, that's way under the mark. It's probably not going to be a series where the teams get to that number of possessions. This is going to be a series where I think you typically see the total actually fly under the number of possessions. I know Milwaukee can be a bit of a juggernaut on offense, but they're just not going to be against Boston. And then Boston, who's like, they're not that great offensively. They have some decent offensive players, but they won their games this season with stifling, brilliant defense. What are they going to do against Milwaukee? You know, is Jason Tatum going to try to take somebody one-on-one? That's not going to work very well. Jalen Brown, same general story. Ball movement, fine, but it's going to have to be stuff from the perimeter. So if you think the game's going to go over, you think so because you believe Boston's going to have a better shooting game in Game 2. Guys, we are so pumped to introduce some of our new friends, Vincero Collective. If you don't know Vincero yet, they're a premium lifestyle brand out of San Diego carrying watches, sunglasses, and more. Perfect for men or women of any style. Why does Dan, why do I love Vincero? They're modern. They're ethical. With the goal of crafting premium lifestyle accessories for those devoted to growth in any and all aspects of life. Health, wealth, community, whatever. Visit VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall to get a special 15% off and free shipping discount just for our listeners. Again, that's VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall. Vincero spelled V-I-N-C-E-R-O. Their products are stylish. They're of high quality. They're eye-catching. They're modern designs. The watches are stainless steel, durable silicon, and Italian marble straps. For the glasses, all lens are polarized. The frames are handcrafted. And because they know that online shopping can be frustrating, they have a five-year guarantee and a 365-day free return policy. That's nuts, but you don't even need to take my word for it. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews. They've been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, and Newsweek, just to name a few. Go to VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall. Get your 15% off and free shipping offer now. Hey, folks, Dan here. And a reminder, if you look for it, every day is a cause for celebration. You can celebrate a friend for their promotion. Their wedding, they had a baby, or some, you know, life thing. You can celebrate yourself for getting your back to finally crack. It's no easy feat, especially if you got an old back. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in the year 2022 where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes without leaving your couch. Right now, Drizzly is giving all new customers $5 off their first order with code FAST5. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And use the promo code FAST5 for 5 bucks off your first order. It's the number one app for alcohol delivery. 5 bucks off your first order. FAST5, the promo code F-A-S-T-5 at checkout. Go to drizzly.com or download the app today. Enjoy the convenience of beer, wine, and spirits straight to your door in under 60 minutes. I have trouble betting a game like this because you know I like to look for the under, and this series screams under. And I think before game one, I said I I imagined it would probably go under because I thought the fastball for both teams was going to be like, oh, Boston's going to show Milwaukee what they're going to do with Giannis. Milwaukee's going to show Boston what they're doing with their superstars. And the teams didn't adjust in ball game, really. Now they have time to do so between basketball games. Is it enough? I... I would suggest that pace-wise you would look at an over, but you know I really don't want to bet overs in the playoffs because they almost feel a bit fluky for a lot of games. I mean, again, there are teams, the Warriors, the Suns, stuff like that, where 
Uh, and not every Suns game was going over. They had games where Devin Booker was missing, but they're just so efficient on offense. They don't need a ton of possessions. They were getting consistently out-rebounded and winning anyway. So that's a tough one. And do you think Boston bounces back and gets a win? I actually think Milwaukee's a lot better. I've said this already. I thought Milwaukee was a nice value going into this series at an underdog price. Um... Yeah, but I'd be a little surprised, I guess, if Boston got swept in the two games at home, but not that surprised. Only a little. Milwaukee could beat him again. I don't think the Bucks are screwing around anymore. But I do think Boston plays a lot better. So if it, it you know, if Milwaukee's going to win this game, it's going to be tighter. Which means what? I mean, are you going to get slow possessions down the stretch? Tight ball game? The pace suggests an over. The, the personnel suggests an under. So that's a game I probably leave alone. Golden State Memphis, Warriors by two on the road. Total of 227 and a half right now. That's up a little bit from the opening line of 226. The side is basically right where it should be. A lot of early money came in, uh, coming in on the over in this ballgame. After the first one ended, Warriors 117, Grizzlies 116. But we need to point out a couple of extenuating factors. First of all, the total in game one was 223 and a half. So odds makers ratcheted up real quick. Up four points. Two possessions. They've raised the number game over game. So if you thought there was value on the over in game one, that's really being sliced away. There might, and, and to be fair, this game could go over again. It could. Uh, the pace was very high. Warriors had about 120 possessions. This game was flying for stretches. Uh, Grizzlies were basically right around that as well. So, you know, 240 was within reach if, say, Memphis shot the ball better or if the Warriors made more of their free throws or turned it over a little bit less. All of these things could push the game towards the over. The one very large thing that could and probably should push this game towards the under is that Memphis got really nice performances out of the non-jaw guys on the floor. Jaron Jackson Jr. in particular was terrific. He had 33 points. How much of that is because Draymond Green was ejected? It's hard to say. Desmond Bain was quiet. He's dealing with some lower, lower back soreness. And then Dylan Brooks, you know, he'll, he'll run hot and cold, but overall his percentages are not going to be a good thing for him. So, yeah, Jaw's going to have some big ball games. He's going to have to. But then the other stuff for the Grizzlies was better than expected in this one because the Warriors defensively are solid. They're not going to screw up very often. And the Grizzlies only shot 43%. The reason they were right there to po- probably, I should say, win this ball game is that their turnovers were lower. They had a few more free throws. They scored more points at the foul line. I think... Uh. Warriors had 13 points at the free throw line. Grizzlies had 18. It wasn't a huge discrepancy, but that's something that brings a game that wasn't super close or wouldn't have been, I should say, super close and makes it closer. Warriors, the extra turnovers, that sort of balanced out the rebounding discrepancy. Warriors, a better rebounding team than uh, what, mem- or rather, I should say, it'll be a little bit better from the free throw line because the Warriors are just a little bit more disciplined than Minnesota. They're probably not going to foul as much. So if the fouls aren't as insane as the Memphis Wolves series, and this line gets adjusted up by two possessions, and money is still moving the line upward, you might see this thing get as high as 228, 228 and a half. I don't think it'd get as high as 229. That would surprise me. But then, to me, I'm looking at an under at that point. Because I feel like game one had a crazy pace that probably won't be duplicated again. I think you see Draymond Green influence the game defensively. He doesn't want to see Memphis score 116. And, you know, offensively, I don't know what exactly you're going to get out of the Warriors. But, you know, again, to me, it just feels like the pace has to come off a little bit. This thing was lightning fast. So slightly to the under on Warriors-Grizzlies, although, again... You know, pace-wise, it suggests that a game could very well go over. It just, I mean, when you see a line get adjusted up by that much in the playoffs and and 
money still trickling in on the over despite the big adjustment, you've cooked your value on the over. You've cooked it. It was there in game one, as it turned out. I said I wanted to just watch that one, as I as we tend to do with a lot of game ones. Uh, Warriors by a point and a half on the road. I don't. I really don't know what to make of that. Um, you know, they'll be better with Draymond back. Memphis is going to be driving angry in this one because they don't want to go down 0-2 at home, headed out on the road. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, slightly to the under, and then on the side, I like usual, I just, eh, you know, I, I'm not huge into it. I probably leave the, these two games alone at the end of the day. Because, again, Bucks celtics the pace suggested it could get there for an over, but I hate betting them. Warriors-Grizzlies, again, the pace suggests it should get there for an over. But I also think that this Game 2 is going to be very different than Game 1, which was relatively high scoring. So there you go. Not a, not a ton of value in these two games coming up tonight. Lesson of the day. And it's not going to be a super long one because uh, it, it, it does continue to s- fall into kind of the same general bucket of some of our other discussions. And that bucket is the importance of a fast start and the importance of the buy. Remember last week we talked about how incredibly valuable a bye week was in your playoffs. And we ran the polls, and the polls showed the same thing they always do, which is that if all things were equal, the one and the two seed combined should win the playoffs exactly half the time. Because it doesn't actually really matter what happens before they show up. They only have to go through two rounds of playoffs. And then, because of other factors, because those teams are probably a little bit better anyway, but... You could even argue, even if every team was exactly the same, the teams of the bye week having the ability to game plan for the semifinals gives them a big edge on making the finals, even if they don't end up winning it. Because they can take that first week of the playoffs and just set themselves up for the semis when, you know, the three seed, four seed, five seed, six seed, those teams are battling... They're out of moves. They come into Monday already beat up. They got two injured guys. They got some streaming slots they got to deal with. Meanwhile, team with the bye week is just set up there. They made four moves over the previous weekend because it didn't matter. They had nothing going on. Set themselves up with a big, fat games boost to start the week. They still got all their moves left. Nobody's hurt on those teams. And so it always ends up being more like 60 to 65% of the time that the first and second seeds combined win their head-to-head playoff leagues. And this advice isn't so much on the Roto side, although it does fall into this a little bit more now than maybe it used to. And today's lesson is, we need to be a tiny bit more cutthroat even during the regular season. And that's in all respects. We need to be more cutthroat with injuries. And we need to be more cutthroat with guys that cool off. Certainly more so on the head-to-head side. The reason I brought it up on the roto side is it it applies. It just applies at sort of a smaller scale. So let's start on the roto side because I I think this, it's it's still part of the mix. But it's not as severe. So what are the advantages to being a bit more ruthless with your roster on the Roto side? Number one, where it, well, it, where it nails me is when you have, and this is, this is games cap format, it's when you have a few guys that are all in the same bucket. So if you have like four injuries on your Roto team, or you have three injuries and two guys in deep slumps, you're going to have to make a drop of some kind. Whether that's the guy that's slumping or the guy that's injured, that's a call you probably have to make, again, this is on the Roto side, based on what you think those guys can do when they get back to full strength. So 
in that instance, you're dropping the guy with lower upside. The reason you have to look into something like that is even in a games cap format, you can fall so far behind in games played that you simply can't make it up. And that did happen to me and a lot of other teams, actually, in one of my main roto leagues, where I think we had the games cap set at 800 or 88 per starting slot, but we made it much easier to actually use up the games played. Uh, and, like, I... I couldn't, for the life of me, get anywhere near it. I streamed, I made like five, six roster moves a day for the last seven or eight days of the season. I probably added 25, 35 games that I wasn't going to get otherwise, and I still came up almost 20 games short. Because I had seven, eight guys out for like three, four weeks in the middle of the season, and you're just going to fall too far behind because guys are going to still be hurt even as the season ticks along. I actually feel pretty good about making it to kind of upper middle of the pack in that Roto League because a lot of my games played were, trying to steal a line from the Simpsons here, kind of slack-jawed yokels that I picked up in the last few weeks of the season. Those guys had no business logging Roto games for my team. But what I needed to do was I needed to cut guys earlier. I don't specifically remember which guys were hurt on that team and and for how long. I, Bradley Beal, I think, might have been on that team. Uh, what am I? Who are the other? I, again, it's not a massive deal. I had one of the last picks, and that's kind of how those things got. Paul George missed most of the year. Bradley Beal missed a big chunk of the season. Draymond Green missed most of the season. Um, Al Horford went through a big slump in the middle of the year. I was stashing Clay Thompson against all reasonable advice. Will Barton got off to a hot start, and then he was slumping. Larry Nance took a long time to hit value, and then he got hurt. There were just a lot of things that probably should have just gotten obliterated early. Sitting on those guys put me in a position where I was simply too far behind in games played, and it amounts to the same general idea if a guy is hurt or slumping, because either way, you don't want them in your lineup on any given night. So drop the guy who doesn't have upside. You need to have, you can't have that many guys hurt all at the same time, even with a games cap in place. Even with a games cap in place. The Yahoo Pro Leagues are really, really easy to hit the games cap. So in those instances, you know, you can be a little bit more lax with your cuts, but I still think it's kind of the same general idea. They have three IL slots, three bench slots, but, you know, if you have five guys out... You're starting 10, 11 max? That still puts you in a little bit of a bind. But a lot of Roto Leagues only have, you know, 10 starting slots, four bench slots. So if you have three guys out or four guys out and a couple guys just not playing all that well, you're now falling way behind in games played, especially if your league goes higher than 82 per slot. So make the ruthless cut. Now, on the head-to-head side, I think it's more important. On the head-to-head side... I feel pretty strongly that we need to be more ruthless with our cuts. If a guy's out for honest to goodness, and like you can create some sort of non-linear connecting line between what a guy's value should be and how long he needs to be ruled out before you cut him. Uh, and that's fine. Like if you want to if you want to build that, you go right ahead. I just think it's more important to look at the big picture here which is if you have someone and like at the end of the year, I, I, I would have ended up kicking myself because Al Horford came back and played well. But if I'm sitting on Paul George and Bradley Beal, if those guys are out my first and second round picks. I obviously can't drop those dudes until I know what's going on. Although I, you know, frankly, you probably could have dropped Paul George there. Someone else picks him up, sits on him for four months. Have at it. Will Barton should have been dropped. There's just, it's it's such an easy call in head-to-head, and yet when you get face-to-face with it, it becomes damn near impossible. It's so hard to make that call in the moment, and it's so easy to make that call when we're looking back at it. You cannot, you cannot put yourself in a position where, and I we've all been there. Here's the moment I'm talking about. You're staring at your team. 
you got so many guys in, injured that every week you're at like a 12-game disadvantage to your opposition. And this is going on for two, three weeks in a row. You can't do it. First of all, you got no shot of getting a bye week if you take two or three significant head-to-head losses in a row. You're not going to climb back fast enough. Even if all of your guys come back, all these injured dudes, if your team magically gets fully healthy at some point along the way, it's still going to be probably too late because more than likely they're not all coming back at the same time anyway. What's likely to happen, and what happened this year, is that guys sort of trickle their way back into a lineup, and while you're waiting on that, someone else gets hurt. Other teams are dealing with it as well, sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes in a different timeline than when you are. You must, must field a healthy team in head-to-head. Don't be okay. I used to think... In, in the pre-COVID days, this is something that I actually think has changed in the last two to three years. Durability being so important, we're talking about that on Thursday of last week's show. Guys miss so many games right now that it'd be very easy to just say, well, it's probably going to be a bit of a wash between my team and the other teams in my head-to-head league. You're probably right, but that also means that with even the slightest bit of proactivity, of aggression on your part, you can give your team a pretty significant advantage. If we just assume, for the sake of argument, that over the course of your head-to-head season, you're going to play something around 20 weeks of regular season head-to-head matches, and over that time, you and your opponents are going to have about the same number of missed games due to injury. It's not going to be perfect. It's an average. Some teams are going to have, you know, uh, two or more, an extra... 15 to 20 missed injury games. Some are going to have 15 to 20 less. And you can hope that you're on the better side of that mark. But if you just assume that you're in the middle, you can push yourself to the proper side of average by dropping your injured guys and adding an extra 8 to 20 games to your team's ledger over the course of the season. And this isn't even streaming at that point. It's just get a healthy body into your lineup. I talked about this a lot during the season. I don't know how many of you guys remember when we were talking about uh, it was it was the big Omicron wave right around Christmas time. About started about a week and a half before that, and then hit this massive swell, and like half the league was out. And so many of you guys I saw on Twitter and were asking me questions like, "What do we do? Do we add IL slots? My league is going crazy. People are quitting." And I said, "Great," because when the going gets tough. These wimpy fantasy players that are just in it for a, a, you know, a quick whatever. They're going to abandon ship for a little bit. And I think you can apply that to more of the season now because there are so many injured players, because guys miss so many games due to injury these days. If you lean into it a little bit, and you could do it so easily during the COVID swell, you drop a couple of guys, you stream a couple of guys, you keep picking up and dropping all the time. This was a big deal in Roto because you could find third stringers on the waiver wire that were going to post top 70 value for a week. Same story in head-to-head. Maximize your games played. Drop a couple of dudes. Yeah, maybe they come back. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Like with COVID, you're hanging on for 8, 9, 10 days. Okay, fine. But if we're talking about like a top 90, top 100 guy, screw it. I don't need that dude for two weeks. I'd rather get some more stats and go, I don't know, 12-6 and over these two weeks, as opposed to 10-8? and And you're thinking, Dan, that seems short-sighted. What's two games over two weeks? Well, what if you gained a game every single week of your head-to-head season? How would the rankings have changed if you added one game, and that's pretty small because like if you win one category it's it's worth more than that but let's say again that over the course of an entire season you did about one game better every single week what would that have meant what would that have meant i'll tell you right now 
I'd have gone from missing the playoffs to second place in one of my head-to-head leagues. Change your final marker by about 20. And that's just by being a little bit more aggressive. So, again, I say sell the bleep out for a first-round buy. Even if it means that you're down a couple of players that you were actually kind of excited about, but they got hurt and you just can't sit on those guys. A healthy team in head-to-head typically wins. Sure, you can't drop a first or second round pick if you know they're coming back. But couldn't you if you didn't know they were coming back? Maybe this is the, maybe this is the very simple way to look at it. Look at your opponent's team in head-to-head and make sure that you are even or ahead in the number of injured players on your respective rosters. If they have two guys out, make sure you only have one guy out. Two or one. If they have four guys out, make sure you're four, three, two, or one. If they're healthy, you better get that down as close to healthy as you can. I know sometimes you can't get all the way there, but give it the best you got. Because if you play that way in head-to-head, that aggressively, you're probably going to get a first-round buy. And then you're going to be able to set yourself up aggressively for the semifinals, and you're probably going to make the finals. You might not have the best team in the finals because you gave up on a few guys because they were hurt or slumping or whatever, but look at the guys that get picked up the second-to-last, third-to-last week in the season. You might not have needed those dudes you had before. Be aggressive. Be be ruthless. We always talk about doing it during the playoffs. I say do it a little bit more during the regular season. I never felt that way until COVID came along and created a league where a modicum of durability can vault your team to the top of the rankings. Yes, Nikola Jokic can also do it, but durability, especially in the head-to-head side, That's right there behind him. It's like the most important things to have in fantasy right now. Number one, Jokic. Number two, a healthy team. Heaven forbid you have both, which basically is what Jokic is. You're going to stomp some people. Tomorrow, I don't know what the hell we're doing, because that's how we're rolling these days. I'm Dan Bespers for Fantasy NBA Today and Fantasy MLB and Fantasy NFL Today. Please, guys, go check that out. Ethos Fantasy BB FB and BK. Baseball, football, basket. Ball. It's not there, but yeah, it's implied. I implied it, you inferred it. Did I get that right? I think so. At Dan Vespers on Twitter, I'll talk to you over the air. Have a terrific Tuesday. Talk to you tomorrow, Wednesday. That's what comes after. Later, everybody. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest-growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO, and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.